All right, good evening, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I am utilizing a new camera microphone this evening. So if I happen to cut out on you, uh, please let me know. It is a new conference cam uh, conference type microphone, so I don't have to wear one on my head. I hate putting those little things on my head. So, uh, and also it should work where you can hear everybody else within the classroom. So everybody else in the classroom, y'all should be able to hear them when they end up asking questions uh, so that you don't have to, or I don't have to repeat it. It kind of makes it easier for everybody uh, to be able to hear the questions that are being asked within the classroom. So hopefully it's right. I installed it myself and normally if I install something, it doesn't work. Uh, so if it doesn't work, it wouldn't surprise me. But uh, what we're going to end up doing is we're going to go on and, and catch into and get into our material for tonight. Uh, we are going to be talking about common contract mistakes. Now, let me explain in this situation with these uh, things we're going to talk about. I know that there is only a total of 10 slides that are here, but these 10 slides are actually ways to stop yourself uh, from ending up getting basically uh, either losing your license, suspend it, or getting a penalty or a fine. So the material that we're going to discuss tonight is going to be extremely important in regards to the context uh, of how to protect yourself from having any type of fines given against you and stuff to that nature. So very first thing that we want to go ahead and get started with uh, and that we're going to talk about this evening um, we're going to basically like I said talk about the common contract mistakes uh, and so the first one that we're going to start off with in this particular situation is we're going to talk about describing the issues uh, with the identification of the parties and the property in a sales contract uh, we're also going to describe the issues in the sales contract regarding the check boxes, signatures, effective dates, and any of the addenda. I uh, will also discuss the proper and improper use of the special provisions paragraph of the sales contract. And we'll also explain what makes property real or personal and the need to address these issues in the sales contract. And then lastly, we will describe the terms of marketable title and cloud on title. Now we've already discussed the last bullet there uh, in the previous classes, but we're gonna re-enhance those, uh, those issues to make certain that everybody has a clear understanding of how this basically works out. So tonight is gonna be a lot about basically uh, making certain that everyone has an understanding. So you're going to see a lot more like we did uh, yesterday, talk about examples. We're going to be utilizing that a lot in this class tonight because of the fact is the best way to teach you the material is to give you real life hypotheticals that might occur and you know how to properly go in and handle each and every one of those particular situations. So with that being said, one of the key things that we want to go and look at is basically starting off with the contract. Uh, majority of the issues that do occur are going to be dealing with the contract in itself. Okay, The contract itself is where 90% of most issues occur. And the reason that this occurs is because of the fact what happens in the real life situations is your client, you and your client, they're already pre-approved, you're out showing properties. Now understand if you're in you know, a smaller county, say College Station or Bryan, you normally can be within your office range within probably maybe 30 minutes, if not less, okay? So you can be anywhere within Bryan College Station within 30 minutes, even in some situations, you could be even in neighboring cities and still be back Within your, or within your office within about 30 minutes. Now, with that being said though, when you are living in a city, say you live in Dallas, 
you live in Houston, you live in Austin, you live in any of the bigger cities, you can literally be just a couple of miles from your office. But traffic can be so horrendous that what ends up happening is you are actually just a few miles could be 30 minutes to your office. Okay. So when we're talking about these particular situations, we want to understand the, the concept of exactly what I'm trying to get at is the distance. And what I mean by this, and this is very important for you to understand, is say, for example, that Mr. Darren is in Houston, okay? His office is located within Cyprus, and he has a client that wants to go see a property down in Pearland, Texas. All right. Now, Pearland, Texas is still part of Houston Association of Realtors, still part of HART. So Darren drives from his office down to Pearland, shows a property, client goes over and says, I love this property. This is the one I want. I need a contract drafted up and I want it now. Okay, I've got to get it. So Darren calls the other agent, Mr. Jacob being the other agent. He calls him and he says, uh, Mr. Jacob, I got a client that wants to submit an offer. And Mr. Jacob says, well, Darren, I've already got an offer coming in. There's one coming in. And, uh, and it's for list price. And Darren says, well, give me just a little bit of time so that I can get back to the office and I can draft our contract. We can run some comps and everything and we can get our contract to. Well, the thing is, Darren has, has a problem or has, might have forgot is this situation is that what has happened in this particular situation is that Darren did not tell Mr. Jacob that he's going to be probably an hour to an hour and a half, if not more, back to his office. And the failure is, is that Mr. Jacob in this particular situation, he goes over and he ends up Mr. Jacob goes into this, this particular situation and he hasn't heard from Darren. And so what happens is Mr. Jacob goes ahead and accepts the offer of the previous person. So he does not even get to see Darren's offer. The problem with this and the biggest issue that happens in real estate is that people, number one, they fail to communicate. That's one of the biggest issues. There is failure to communicate and keep all parties up to date. So Darren has learned in this particular situation, he has learned that what has happened is that he himself has very limited time when his client wants to end up purchasing a house. To draft up a contract, he has very little time to actually get everything together. So what happens is Darren from here on out says, all right, I'm not going to let that happen again. I'm not going to drop the ball. So Darren takes with him a laptop and Darren has the laptop and Darren goes over and he ends up in this particular situation. He goes and he's showing a house. Client loves the house. Client enjoys the house. Okay. And what ends up happening though is, is Darren is not going to get messed up this time. He ain't going to lose the contract. So Darren sits down in his car and he quickly drafts up a contract. And as he completes his contract, he fails to fulfill some of these items we're going to talk about tonight. He does not fully execute the contract or he doesn't put boxes. He doesn't check the boxes where they're supposed to be checked in. He ends up in this particular situation. Darren basically throws what I call a skeleton contract over to the other agent. He quickly throws it over to Mr. Keith and Mr. Keith gets the contract and about 50% of the contracts fully executed. The other 50 is blank. Okay. It's called a skeleton contract is what I call it. He's basically, he's not put any meat on it. He's just created the skeleton and said, here you go. Well, the problem with this and the biggest issue with this is that what occurs is when you leave things blank, okay, or you don't fulfill, the, or fulfill them or fully complete them, what happens in this particular situation is now you end up, you left that contract open for the other agent to just fill in what they want, okay? So in that particular situation, what has to happen is 
that we end up, we have to make certain that we complete all contracts fully before they're sent over, okay? One situation that I've seen happen before is an agent completed, they were, they were showing a house, this, this actually happened about four years ago here in College Station. Houses were ending up selling so quickly that they would put it on the market. They would literally, Mr. Grossman would get a listing, he'd put it on the market, and within, no lie y'all, within about 30 minutes of it hitting the MLS, there was already like five people lined up to go see the house. Five people, okay? So Mr. Grossman goes over here, he lists his house, and he's got five people. Well, Miss Linda is the fifth person to show the house. So if Mr. Garrett was the first person to show, Mr. Garrett's client loves it, what happens? Mr. Garrett's going to go back, he's going to draft up a contract, he's going to send it over to Mr. Grossman, and he's seen all these other people here. So do you think he's going to make certain, do you think Garrett's going to send it to a transaction coordinator for review or his broker for review or any of that? No. He's just going to send it. He's not even going to review it. Just, here you go. Here you go, Mr. Grossman. Here's a contract. And Mr. Grossman gets the contract. And Mr. Grossman goes over here. And he ends up, Mr. Grossman gets it. And he says, well, yeah, we'll accept it. But you're going to accept it with these terms. And what he does is Mr. Grossman goes in and Mr. Grossman makes changes to the contract. Okay. He makes some changes because there were blanks that Mr. Garrett didn't fill out correctly. And so what happens is, is Garrett being in a rush, ends up, has his, sign, his client sign the contract. His client fully signed the contract. So here's Stefan, he went in, he changed some stuff, sends it back, Mr. Garrett signs it, doesn't even read through it, he's just trying to get locked under contract so Miss Linda can't get her contract in. He's rushing through this, and Mr. Garrett has signed a contract, or has his client sign a contract that included in there that they'll pay an extra maybe $5,000. Well, because we did not fulfill our duties of reviewing our contract, we ended up, our job, we have failed to fulfill our duty, our job, okay? It is imperative, it is imperative that Mr. Jacob and Mr. Miss Linda and everybody else in this situation they end up, they may have taken their time to get a contract over to Mr. Grossman, but what's ended up happening is they may have lost out on it, but they didn't get their clients screwed like Garrett did. Okay, so what I'm trying to emphasize here, what I'm trying to get to everybody here, is basically talking about in this situation is that when we're going through these particular situations, Okay. When you are running in regards to operating on a daily basis, you're going to be busy. Okay. I tell my agents all the time, it is imperative that you have a laptop. You need to have a laptop and that laptop needs to be with you no matter where you go. No matter where you go, even if you're going on vacation, you better have a laptop. You better also have access to the internet. Okay. Because the fact of the matter is, the days of where you could go show a property, come back to your office, sit down, draft a contract, have your broker review it, and end up then submit it over is long gone. They're long gone. Okay? You do not have time to go through and have somebody review your contract if you're waiting to come back to the office and all of this. You need to have access to sit down at a computer and you need to be able to type up a contract in your car sometimes. I've been there, done it. Okay. I pulled off into an Exxon station, get outside because I'm so tired of sitting in my car, put my laptop on the trunk of my car, and I'm typing up a contract with my cell phone as my hotspot. And I'm typing a contract up. I've been there, I've done it, okay? Now you may say, well, Mr. Nobles, you know, what if I'm in that situation? What if I have to end up, what if I gotta get over here and I have to end up, 
I've got, you know, Mr. Grossman's already got a contract and my client has to have this house, you know, and my client's with me and they're like, you know, get this done, get this done, get this done. You know, do, can I just, can I exclude my broker? Do I, do I not have him review it? What do you think, Miss Linda? No. Can I ask why you say no? Can you talk just a little louder so that everybody can hear you? No, because of the fact that the broker needs to review the documents just in case if there is a an error on the contract and things like that or something's not filled in correctly or whatever. Mr. Eugene, do you agree or disagree? And I don't want you just following along with it. Do you agree or disagree? Mm -hmm. Think about this. Let me put it more in perspective for you. You're a real estate agent, okay? You work a job, you get off of work, your client gets off of work at five, you both meet at a property, Mr. Grossman's a listing agent, okay? When you get there, you see Mr. Garrett, you see Mr. Keith, you see, uh, and Mr. Jake, you see all these people and Darren, they're all there in front of you, okay? You get there to the property and there's four people in front of you and you call Mr. Grossman and said, hey, you know, I'm gonna, we want to show, and he says, well, we've already got two offers in, okay? And you say, well, Mr. Grossman, I want to get my offer in. And he says, well, we're taking the best one, you know, the one that comes in, that's the one we're taking. Do you have time to send the contract to your broker? Not for review? Not really, no. Not really, no. Not really, no. Yeah, you get it on in. You got to get it in because yeah. other, you, you have a, if you remember from earlier in this class, you have a fiduciary duty to who? Your broker no. or to your client? To the client. To both. Oh, both. Okay. You're right. But here's also another thing is you have a fiduciary duty to your client to get his offer in. As fast as possible. But Miss Linda's also right too. You're right. And so Miss Linda's right. You're both right in that situation. Because of the fact is, is yes, you have a fiduciary duty, Mr. Eugene, to end up to get your client's offer in ASAP. Okay. But what happens if Miss Linda is the transaction coordinator and she goes home at five o'clock and your broker goes home at five o'clock and you got to get a contract in. Miss Linda, what do you do in that situation? What you're supposed to do, at least what I think you should do. Let's, let me rephrase it for you. What should you? What are you legally supposed to do? What did you say first? What's the first thing you told me? You're supposed to notify your broker. You're supposed to go to the broker or the transaction coordinator mm -hmm. for review. That's what you're supposed to legally do. That's your job. But at the same hand, what do you do? If Mr. Eugene doesn't get it in within the next 15 minutes, lose and he loses the deal for his client for, for failure of administrative protocol. You see the problems here. And I give you those, and like I said this evening, I'm giving you hypotheticals because of the fact is this is real life. This is not something just ends up, it's perfectly done. I guarantee you, everybody that's listening to me tonight, I have had these discussions with many people, many brokers, many people from the state, even my own people, my own members, my office manager. We've had these discussions. My office manager put it great to me one day. Justin, you cannot solve every solution. You can't think of every single situation that's going to happen. It's just impossible. And she's 100% correct. Okay. Sometimes as a real estate agent, you have to put a contract out without your broker seeing it. But Miss Linda, does that mean that you can just willy nilly send your own contracts out without ever showing your broker? No. What you should do is if you if you're in that situation, you should if you have to send the contract out to meet the, the uh, time frame or the deadline or whatever, then what you need to do as soon as you do that, then you should call the broker 
your broker and let your broker know that you just submitted a contract. That way he could go in and review it. And if there is any uh, questions or whatever, then he can talk to you and discuss it with you. Exactly. Exactly in that situation. Ms. Ms. Lundy, you're right on it. That is exactly what you're supposed to do. You are supposed to, when you submit a contract, Mr. Eugene, in that situation, yes, if Mr. Grossman says he's got to get a contract in, send one over. Complete it as much as you can, get it sent over. But immediately after you do that, you need to call your broker. It is advisable, however, that after Mr. Eugene's called Mr. Grossman, he should immediately, however, have called his broker right after. And the broker should have ended up saying, yes, send it over, but I will get in as soon as I can to review it. Okay. However, understand that if you're going to complete these contracts, you better be aware of all these things that we're putting in here. We're going to talk about, because as I can tell you this right now, 90% of the time when you send a contract over, they're going to do what to it, Mr. Grossman? When you initially send an offer, what are they going to do? What's it called? Um, what? Counter. Counter oh. They're going to counter it. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're going to come over and they're going to counter it back to you. And they're going to say, hey, I don't like these changes. Make these changes. And let me tell you something. Those changes are not going to hit, or those counters are not going to come until probably the next morning. Okay. But again, only, only in extreme circumstances should you ever in that particular situation submit a contract without your broker or transaction coordinator or office manager know it. It is in best practice that you call that agent if they say that they're in a rush. You call your broker, office manager, or whoever you're supposed to, and you let them know. Some brokers may be awake. Okay? That has happened before. There may be some times that a broker may end up they're awake and they're sitting at home doing nothing. They can review one real quick. Okay. But there are some times, just as a broker myself, that I'm busy. I'm busy. I may be on the road driving and I don't have a computer and I won't have a computer for maybe probably maybe an hour two hours mr eugene you got an hour two hours to wait on me no know. not really you got 15 minutes so it is imperative that when you are practicing in real estate it's imperative that you be able to make judgment calls but you make the right judgment calls okay very important so tonight what we're going to do is if you happen to have the one to four family, if you have access to a computer, go ahead and pull up the one to four family. Okay, put it on the side. Put it on the side of the computer here if you want to. But what we're going to end up doing, those of you that don't have it, no worries, no big deal. But what we're going to end up doing is we're going to end up having a discussion about the common errors that occur in the one to four family. Okay. The most common one that you would think, the most common sense item that you would think everybody would understand is the first one, naming of the parties. That's easy. You can't screw that up, right? You can't screw that up. You can't. Let me just put it this way. I was in a conference this morning. One of the things we were talking about was basically people's names. Some people have different names. They come from different backgrounds and they don't have a normal name, quote unquote normal name. And so you go over here and you may say, I can't tell you how many people have done this with mine. Mine is, you, I think, it's easiest name, Nobles. That's so easy to spell. Noble with S on it. That's easy. I can't tell you how many times I got N-O-B-E-L-S. I'm not Nobels, I'm Nobles. Like Noble with an S? 
Okay? But they still, oh yeah, yeah, N-O-B-E-L-S. No, that's that's not right. N-O-B-L-E-S. I can tell somebody Justin. What's your name? Justin. They'll write down Jason. I've seen them spell for Mr. Grossman, Stefan. I remember the first time I had Mr. Grossman in my class, I was like, shh, on. Didn't even know how to say his name. Completely had no idea. Still to this day, probably ain't saying his name right. German. But the thing is, is that people don't, you can't just assume. And let me tell you this too. Miss Linda, how do you spell Sarah? My name's Sarah. How do you spell it? Well, there's two ways. S-A-R-A or S-A-R-A-H. I'm sorry. I spell it S-A-R-R-A. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? So in that situation is everybody can have a different name, a different way. Okay. So the key thing is is the naming of the parties. We have to, we have a duty to include their full, what's that word right there? Legal. What? Legal. Legal name. My dad, he goes by the, well, doesn't go by it, but people used to call him uh, Luli. His, his mom calls him Luli. Okay? That's, that's a nickname that was given to it. Mr. Eugene, if we go put Luli Nobles on the contract, is that correct? Nope. Why is it not correct? That's not my legal name. That's not your legal name. What, what about your uncle? I think it's your uncle. His nickname Shorty. Could you, could you imagine we put Shorty Nobles? Yeah. Is that his, is that his legal name? No. Nope. So in that situation, no matter what your nickname may be, you cannot put nicknames in a contract. And guys and gals, I've had clients that have asked me, can you put my nickname in the contract? Nope. Only legal names. Another thing, guys and gals, extremely important. Real estate agents make this mistake all the time all the time they end up they put in their spelling of the name like i said earlier my name's sarah miss linda goes s-a-r-a -A. it's s-a-r-a -A. she submits it i'm in a rush i'm at work and she sends it to me and I'm, okay sign i'm gone i didn't read the contract that, that happened all the time clients won't read the contract it's all the way to closing. They're sitting down at the table. All the documents put out, and they're getting ready to sign. And they're like, all right, spell your name as printed. That's not my name. What? That's not my name. It's S-A-R-R-A. -R -R -A. Somebody left an R out. Oh, crap. And the buyer's already signed, and you're here. Oh, crap. We got to redo all the documents. See a problem here? Oh, yeah. Not something that you do. You don't guess. You have them write it down. Because, guys and gals, I've had a contract where the person was mobilely signing. They were out. They were not able to come into the office to sign. So they were a mobile notary went out and signed. Notary went out to their property, signed the paperwork, and ended up, the lady was like, no, that's not how you spell my name. Not how you spell my name. The whole thing had to be redone and they had to wait three days because it was a Friday and title was closed until Monday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, nothing happened. It is imperative you include their full legal names. Don't simply put Benjamin Charles Wright and wife Christina. Not right. Because let me tell you something. Well, that may, you would assume what? What would you assume here, Mr. Garrett? 
what would you assume if you saw Benjamin Charles Wright and wife Christina, what would you assume Miss Christina's last name would be? Uh, Charles Wright. Do you think it's last is going to be right? But her last name, guess what happens? Her last name is Stevenson. So if you put down here, Christina Wright, it's actually Christina Stevenson. And guess what? You've now just insulted her. You have to in this situation, you got to make certain, guys and gals, that we make certain we know what their names are. Another thing is, you cannot assume things either. Something that's not talked up here, we'll, we'll get to it, but you can't assume marital status. You want to really insult somebody, I'll give you an example. My, uh, my dad and I ended up, I can't remember where we went to, went somewhere shopping, went checked out, and the guy behind the counter was like, went over, looked at my dad and me, and was like, are y'all brothers? I was like, how, how just like rude to call me that old man's brother. <laughs> I was like, how rude. But no, but, but what I'm saying in this situation is that what I'm getting at is that you don't just assume those things. Nor do you end up in a situation, do you ever want to tell a girl, say that your mom and, and her daughter are shopping, and they go over there and they look at the daughter and say, oh, are y'all sisters? Think how a girl would feel. The mom's going to love it. The daughter's going to end up saying, oh, Lord, I'm not that old. Okay? So you never assume just things. Okay? You also don't assume marital status. What I mean by that, I'm not just talking about married. I'm talking about single, too. Okay? I've had an agent before that was working with two ladies, two nice ladies, and they ended up, they were, had the last name, both had the same last name, and the agent was like, oh, are y'all sisters? And they were like, uh, no, don't you see the ring? Okay, you don't assume those things, okay? You don't just assume when you're going through this, you have a duty to your clients to ask these questions without just assuming. Guys and gals, things are different compared to way back when life has changed. Okay, so in that situation, we do have things that you do not want to end up just assuming. You do need to ask, don't just go over and say it. So if you happen to see Say, I see uh, Linda and Eugene, I walk up. I'm not just going to say, hey, are y'all husband and wife? I need to say, may I ask, are y'all married or are y'all single? And if you're single, is this going to be a business transaction or is this not going to be a business transaction? Okay. You ask those questions where they tell you. And if you don't want to feel embarrassed, put it in writing. Because I'm going to tell you. I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot. I've dealt with a lot. Okay. You may end up thinking that, say, for example, there may be two, uh, say, two guys, two different last names. They're buying a property. They both, when you're showing the property, are talking about hunting. They want to go out and hunt. They want to go have a deer lease. That's what they're wanting to do. So when you're drafting up your contract, you put both their names on it. And you're like, all right, so this is uh, what business are we dealing with? And you end up, they're like, wait, this isn't a business. We're, we're, we're married. Okay. You have to end up, don't put yourself into that situation. And I emphasize that, guys and gals, because of this situation. is as things continue to progress, we're seeing more of the LGBT protections and as a real estate agent, if you say the wrong thing, it can get you into trouble. 
So you have to, that's one of the things that I spend time on this section for, is because of the fact is, you gotta be aware of these things. It's your job. But like I tell people all the time is, understand, it's your job to do this, it's not your job to judge. You may not agree with it, you may not like it, that's your business. But like I tell people all the time is in this situation is understand this, everybody's money is money. Get the money, move on, do what you want. But in the situation is you have a duty when you're acting as an agent, you have a duty to respect everyone. It doesn't have to be LGBT, it can be race. Guys, I can tell you in situations too, a couple will come in. There's a, uh, there is, actually I've got, I've got some time, so I'm going to see if I can't find this real quick. Hold on here. It's a good video. I want to always try to play this for all my classes. Okay, hopefully the sound will work. Sunday afternoon in an upscale suburb of New Jersey. It's an open house. This $1.4 million home is for sale. But these folks are about to get more than they bargained for. Hello. Welcome. My name is Margo. Hi, Margo. Margo is the woman showing the home. Nice to meet you. But not everyone is welcome hello hello uh, i'm just saying thank you pleasure. sure um what would you like to see the neighborhood is predominantly white will anyone speak up when she tries to keep it that way it sounds like you know you're more maybe more comfortable in, in an urban area where there might be someone more like like self maybe <laughs> most people say nothing at first but what's this mother and daughter you know, I don't know that you're in the right house. Yeah, you know, well, I know um, that there aren't a lot of people of color in in this area. I know. Area. Yeah, my, excuse me. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sorry, but you know, I'm just I was just trying to be realistic with them. Okay, and I was thinking about what we have, what we do, and yeah, everybody looks here. They can't seem to leave the house fast enough. I don't know where you talk about that, but I've got to go now. Well, I I know. Know. They have no idea that Margot and the African American couple are actors working for us. He's going to do a hidden camera experiment to see how people respond to racism. We have a very nice, calm neighborhood. You know, we don't have a lot of altercations and things like that. You know, they don't we have people that are in trouble. You know, well, I, I don't know. You can tell this man hears everything, but at first we're not sure whose side he's on. I have a suggestion. I don't know that you're going to accomplish anything more than ready, but uh, um, I just look at the house. Turns out he's a realtor. Bertha was astounded uh, that in uh, this time, uh, you know, in this century, that uh, I was hearing what I was hearing. And then you tried to help the African American couple out. Uh, you know, I happened to uh, have heard more than I thought was uh, appropriate and uh, thought that you know, we were going to move on and try to do something about it. He sincerely concerned, he's sympathetic, he's trying to find some way to make this situation right. Dr. Jack DeVito is a social psychologist and expert on race at Yale University. But if you're really concerned about racism, you have to take um, an active step and confront the racist. Now watch this young woman. You know, you say you have children, you want them to fit in. Her response is immediate, and she's having none of it. Yeah, I didn't know you've ever spoke with him. It's yeah. excellent. 
you don't have African Americans in this. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, yes. I guess, but but I'm thinking that yeah, but these are people that aren't. Well, I, I don't they're think not. I don't think they're. I don't think they're, they're like us. I I have never in my life. Can you? Are you? I'm 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 embarrassed. I'm so sorry. Well, Honestly, my years on this earth, I've never experienced anybody saying anything like that. I apologize. I'll be at of this town. That's horrific. Well, I'm sure embarrassed. Well, I, 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 I think that you should go. Well, this is so uh, shocking. I'm humiliated. When we finally tell Mindy Shire that all our actors, she's still overwhelmed with emotion. I'm about to cry right now. I'm so upset. I think she'll be fine. Nobody had to prompt her. In fact, she was energized. She walks out with a lot of energy to really confront that situation. And she creates a bond with Mindy Shire. Well, I'm going to say that Mindy Shire is going to be fine. Yeah. I'm and she creates a bond with the victims of racism and she touches them. What she did was something that breaks the norm, and that's what makes it grow. Will she be the only one to intervene that way? And what if the target of the attack is a Muslim couple instead? I noticed that uh, uh, she's wearing a, you know, a, a headscarf. And a what religion are you? Muslims? We, we don't have a mosque. <laughs> no, I don't know that you would be. Welcome. Welcome. This woman is so upset by what she hears that she commiserates with another couple, unaware they're also actors working for us. But she says nothing to Margot until. Can I just say something? I mean, do you think Kamala is saying? Do you think I'm comfortable? The thing is, these people are from a country that you are from. They, they, they did not go up the world trade. They did not go up the world trade. I can't have this discussion with well, you. They look like perfectly normal people to me. Just minutes later, Margot is at it again. How are you here? I mean, you know, are you from? You're not obviously not born here in this country. No, we're from Egypt. Uh, Egypt, I see. So uh, you're not American. This woman's face says it all. There are Jewish people. You know, and, and uh, do you get along with Jewish people? Yes, yes we get along with problem. Jewish people. You get along people. with everybody. I'm still like, oh, well, you know, because we don't want to, we really don't want to have problems, you know. You're coming with, with these, with these, the, these foreign languages, you know. I, I, speak, I don't think that's it. I'm yeah, sorry. Well, yes, I know. You know, and, and we have terrorists, and what are terrorists? I'm sorry, I'm going to you, okay? I, I don't know if I said something wrong. Have I said something wrong to her? I, I, I'm not going to get involved with this. That's what she says, but watch what she does. You're just taking blowing things out of proportion. I'm trying to look out for you. And then next to me, she's saying, I would look next to her. You would look, you would, you wouldn't be worried. No, I would not. There are all kinds of religions here. Yeah, but they're not. Really, yeah, well, I'm talking, everybody goes to their own place to pray. Exactly, and exactly. And they respect each other's religions and everyone should be treated fairly. You have the tears in your eyes. Yeah, it's completed. To go somewhere and just be, you know, just someone without knowing you, without knowing anything, to just be so against you. But this man knows what that's like, and he's the next visitor to our home. I'm noticing your attire, and I'm just wondering, and your accent and things, you know, that you're, you're not American, are you? I'm just wondering if, if uh, and anyone has ever felt uncomfortable in, in your presence. Excuse me, I'm, I'm, can I ask a question? Because they have, but um, I don't think it makes sense for to talk to them like that. I have an accent, so I do put it. So yes. I think your, your, your kingdom is unacceptable. You should get a hell in the corner. What is unacceptable? Well, I, I, I just, I, I, I'm just trying to. to I'm your cool dog is unacceptable. Well, you put your status for sale. This for sale for everybody. You said that there is a list. You, you cannot check out. Oh, you, you, you are, you are, you are, you, 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 you are not working for me. This is unacceptable. It turns out Francois Descorbet has himself been a victim of the same kind of discrimination. What do you say to people who hear this? They should speak up. They should speak up. There's no doubt that they should speak up. But only a third of the people who overhear Margot's racist remarks confront her directly. Russell, you're a hero, man. Thank you so much. You're the best. <laughs> so, as you can see there, 
primarily in that situation, you can kind of see at that point, like I said, is we want to make certain, we make certain that y'all can still see. Perfect. As you can see, you can't just make assumptions in those situations. Okay. So coming back here to what we have, you cannot in a situation assume people's marital status, their race, their gender, their name. You can't assume those things. And we're going to spend about probably uh, maybe one day talking about that. But when it comes down to it, you have a duty to make certain that you are fulfilling your obligation. Now, I did want to ask Garrett, can you still see the screen, sir? I'm just making certain because I'm not seeing my lines. Uh, yes, sir. Perfect. Thank you, sir. All right. So in this situation, the next thing is now that we've taken care of the naming of the parties, you do have your naming of the property. And like we said earlier, you cannot simply use just the street address. So if you're selling 123 Main Street, you are not going to name the property 123 Main Street. Okay, you're going to have to actually include the full legal description. Okay, and to do that, you're going to get onto your local CAD, to your local appraisal district, and you're going to type in 123 Main Street, and it will pop up the full legal description. That's why if you're looking at your contract, you'll see there's a spot that says lot, lock, and all of that in there. Now, there may in some situations, there might in some time that your property that you're selling may not have a lot in block, may not have it. If it doesn't in that situation, you will have a line that's afterwards that you can fill it in. Okay, you can put in the stuff. So it may not have a lot in block, it may just have a certain subdivision code. Okay, so again, very important that you understand those particular situations. Because a lot of people, they will just fill in the address and send it over. And when you put the address, all that you're basically stating is, is that you get to buy my mailbox for $300,000. Okay? You need to have the full legal description because it's going to tell you what areas you're buying. Okay? Now, the next thing that we're going to talk about, very important as well, is this one... I can't harp enough on, I, I could spend an entire class talking about this one, but in this particular situation is that we have to make certain that people understand that when you're completing a contract, there are provisions, there are little boxes that are by the contract. Okay, so you'll see a paragraph. You may see paragraph three, and they are say, I'm just making this up, there are two boxes and you fill in the first box, the first part of that paragraph, but you don't check the box. If you don't check the box and you just fill it in, it does not apply. Okay, I'm gonna re-say that. If you don't check the box, but fill it in, it doesn't apply. So say for example, that you put in that you're asking for 10 days for a certain thing, maybe for title or something, you get, but you fill in 10 days, but you don't check the box. When a court reviews it, if it goes to court, the court's going to tell you, we're not even going to look at that section because you did not check the box. It is your duty to check the box, period. No ifs, ands, buts about it. Okay, so again, the check boxes within the paragraphs are the promulgated contracts that contain check boxes that assign responsibility to or provide important information. Failure to fill in these items out, or, fa or failure to fill these items out can delay the transaction and ultimately cause contention between the parties can't tell you how many times that I've ran into that issue, okay? You have to make certain, it is your duty to make certain that when you are completing the contracts, that the contracts must 
be fully executed. Guys, I, I can tell you, when I have my office manager review the contracts, her biggest, biggest complaint is failure for them to complete the contract fully. The contract not being fully completed. You make one little mistake, and guys, I've been there. I've done it. When I was a younger agent, I didn't have really anybody supervising me. I had to go through. I had to make mistakes on my own, and I ended up, I'm telling you, I cost myself a lot of money out of my commission over the years because I got in a rush. Okay? You have to make certain when you're going through this that you are checking the boxes, that you are Xing, you're including everything. You being lazy is not an excuse. You go to a judge and say, uh, Your Honor, Mr. Eugene, uh, I, I was so busy that, you know, I just, I'm busy. And, you know, I'm a real estate agent. I sell 10 houses a month, Mr. Eugene. And, you know, you need to feel sorry for me, Mr. Eugene. Okay, Mr. Eugene? What are you going to tell me? No. Do you care? Nope. Why don't you care? Not my problem. But, but I'm a busy you person. Got, you got a obligation to fulfill. But I'm a busy person. Get over yourself. But I'm busy. I'm important. No, you're not. That's, That's, That's right. It is not Mr. Justin that is important. It's your client. It's your duty to your client. It is your duty to read those contracts. Guys, I can tell you in this situation, one of the biggest things that I see in real estate agents that they fail to do is they end up, they want everything to work around their schedule. They want life to work around their schedule. And I'm going to tell you this. This is one thing that your parents, if you're younger, your parents have one thing on top of you, but they'll have one advantage. And all, all older agents will have an advantage over the younger ones. Is the fact of the matter is that they understand deadlines. They understand if they miss a deadline, they could be homeless. They don't go over there and pay that mortgage payment, their house could be taken from them. They end up, they don't pay their car note, their car is taken from them. They understand that. The key thing that you have to understand is you, if you're going to get into this field, this is a field that requires full time attention. If you're going to get in this field to be part time, then you better be ready and you better understand in that same situation that if you're going to be part time, that's fine, but you better have your phone on still from eight to five, Monday through Friday. Even if you work a job, I myself work a job, full-time job, and I run other businesses. I have a lot going on. But one thing that everybody will tell you is my phone is always in my pocket. There are days I would love to sleep in until 10, 11, 12 o'clock. But if I miss something, then guess what happens? I could end up costing not only my client stuff, but I could end up costing myself money. So you have a duty when you're dealing with this to fulfill your obligation, to fulfill your duties of reviewing these contracts. The biggest issue that I see, like I said, is right here. This bullet, this whole thing right here on the screen. Check boxes are important. You miss a check box, Say, for example, you're going through and you're just check, 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 check. I'm trying to go through this really, really quick. And your client told you, well, I want to make certain that uh, the seller, if, I, if they're going to accept my contract, I want to make certain that the seller repairs uh, the porch in the back. Well, when you're rushing through it, you check client accepts property as is, and you send it, and they sign, it's executed. You can go try to amend it, and they're like, nope, we already signed this thing. Guess what? Guess who's getting to pay for that porch repair? No, out of your commission. Because that, that buyer's going to turn around and go, Mr. Eugene, I told you and you failed to do it. We're taking it out of your commission. 
And you're going to say, well, I'm not going to pay for it. Okay, well, that's fine. Just refuse to pay for it. But what will happen is they'll just sue you. And then once they sue you, they're going to get the money plus more. And they're probably going to get your real estate license too. So it's not something to play around with. It's not something. And I tell you these things not to scare you for real estate. It's not, I don't want that put there in any way. But I'm telling you this from this situation. I want you to understand the importance of you fulfilling your duty, your fiduciary duty. You, we're going to get to this when we get to agencies. But I want to explain something in regards to fiduciary duty, okay? You know how a lawyer, when you hire an attorney, their level of duty is up here, okay? They're, the, the, the highest level of care you can get is fiduciary. So when you hire an attorney, that attorney has fiduciary duty. When they hire you as a real estate agent, it's the same level. But do you know what the difference is? You want to get a real estate license or you want to become an attorney, can you sit through a couple of classes in here with me and get your attorney's license? No. you got to go years and years and years and years and years and years of school and extremely difficult tests. You want to become a real estate agent, you sit in here with me for a couple of months, and after a couple of months, boom, you're a real estate agent. But you have the same care as an attorney does. You have the same level as an attorney does. You have to understand in these situations, guys and gals, this is not about you. You have a job. I heard somebody once tell me, a newer agent once told me, said, well, I'm going home for the day. I said, okay, well, that's fine. And I'll see you tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Okay. Just make certain that you got your phone. Well, I'm going home. In real estate, there is no clocking out and clocking in. There's none. There's no clock in, clock out. You do not get the option of simply going in here and, okay, I'm going home at 5 and I'm not going to answer any phone calls. You don't get the, the choice of going over and waking up at 10, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock in the morning and expecting everything to just work at your pace. It doesn't work that way. There are, there are time frames or timetables. I tell people this all the time. The most busiest time for a real estate agent, when do you think it is? The beginning of the transaction, the middle, or the end. What do you think, Mr. Garrett? When is the most busiest time for the for basically the buyer's agent? Beginning, middle, or end? What do you think? Uh, I would say the end. You say the end, Miss Linda? Would you agree with that? I would. Uh, really. Louder, sure. please. Really, there's not. I mean, you're busy if you because you got to stay on top. I'm just I saying. would say if I had to choose, I would probably say the middle. So you say the middle, Mr. Eugene. How about the beginning? So you say the beginning, Mr. Grossman. Middle, all right, beginning, middle, or end? Um, the end, but they're pretty much you're busy the whole time. So you say the end. So I got two ends, a beginning, and a middle. Mr. Uh, Keith, what do you think? I would say the end, but to be honest, I think the whole process is going to be really busy. Well, here's the thing. I'll tell you all. The most busiest time for a real estate agent is what Mr. Eugene said. It's the beginning. In the beginning, as a buyer's agent, your duty is you have to get the contract once it's signed. You got, so you have to draft it. So you get to draft the contract. After you draft the contract, you get to do all the negotiation back and forth. Then you do all the changes to the contract. Then once it's signed, you gotta go get all these checks. Then you gotta go receipt the checks to so the title, the other agent, all that. Then you gotta schedule inspections. You gotta go to the inspections. You gotta amend the contract for any inspection concerns. And then after all of that's done, then it's relaxing. Until when? Until the end. No, the appraisal. I always tell people this, whatever your option period is, 
whatever the length of your option period is, that's the that's how busy you're going to be. If you have a seven day option period, you might as well for the next seven days, you're busy. Just you're busy. Period. You don't have nothing else. You need to be awake at 8 a.m. You need to be staying awake early. You need to be ready for stuff. You need to be on top of it. You got to be on top of this stuff. Seven days, you got to stay on top of it. Because the fact is, a lot of moving parts are going in the beginning. I just received a contract today, or yesterday. Mr. Grossman and I ended up receiving a contract. Yesterday and today have been nonstop, just phone call, phone call, phone call, phone call, phone call, phone call. Nonstop. Change this, move this, lender needs this. Nonstop. Crazy busy. But the thing is, is that for the option once I finish and everything works out, then the remainder of the transaction will be smooth sailing. But I gotta be busy in the beginning. Okay? So what I tell people all the time is in the beginning, you're crazy busy. But afterwards, it's pretty much smooth sailing. Okay? Unless appraisal comes back, we'll talk about that later. Now you're probably like, all right, Mr. Post, keep this going, keep it moving. But I'm telling you these things because of the fact is I'm not trying to bore you. I'm telling you these things because of the fact of the matter is, is that I want to ensure, okay, that you're aware of these things, that you're not going to say, well, he never taught me this stuff. I'm preparing you for real life, okay? Now this part right here, this is a very big one, and this is one that they're actually going to test you a lot on. Way back, way back in the days, probably 30 years, 20, 30 years ago, a real estate contract consisted of the parties. It consisted of the, there was the parties, the property, and it consisted of a blank page and signature information. So you had a legal sheet of paper, the parties, the address, and then a very big middle part that was blank, and then signature date and all of that of the parties. And it's pretty simple, one page. You can buy real estate with one piece of paper. And what happened was, was that the real estate agents would write in their own terms. They'd fill everything in in that blank space. Well, that blank space used to be called special provisions. And it, what it was, was that the parties put their names, they ended up put their names of the parties, the property, and it was blank, and you put in a bunch of stuff. Seller takes this, buyer takes that, we need options for inspections, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Majority, probably 70% of the paper was blank for the real estate agents just hand write in stuff. Nowadays, the special provisions is probably, if you're lucky, three, like if you hit return on the, on the Word document, it's like three returns hit. It's like you hit the return button three times. That's special provisions. Why do you think, Ms. Linda, they went from almost 70% of the paper being blank to now just very little for special provisions? One to save time, number two, they created other forms. <laughs> Can you say it a little louder? One to save time. The second one is they have other forms for you to fill out. That's right. What happened is, is you're not an attorney, are you, Ms. Nobles? Nope. No. Mr. Eugene, are you an attorney? Nope. Mr. Grossman, you're an attorney? No, we're not, none of us are attorneys. Not even me, I'm just a broker. Okay. So in these particular situations, we cannot write legal terms within this provision. It is to only be used for factual statements and business details. For example, if we go in and we want to put something about there's nothing, nowhere else in the contract or no other form, Say that we want to um, we want to end up 
we want the seller to move the uh, want the seller to move the trampoline away from the property or off the property within five days. That would be something we could use for special provisions. We can state factual statements, but we cannot. Licensees should not use the paragraph for legal rights or remedies, items for which a trick addenda or other form already exists. If a form exists, you do not, you do not fill in that information. For example, if I say seller is to leave the hot tub at the closing and funding of this transaction. I can't do that because there's a form, an addenda, that is non-realty items. Meaning I put that in that form. I don't put that in here. I don't put that in special provisions. It goes into that particular form. You have to make certain when you're dealing with these things that licensees have to understand, you do not put legal rights and remedies. This is one of the biggest spots I see all the time. Client or agent will, will submit a contract for review to me. I get the contract, I sit down, I'm going through the contract and it says, if seller does not remove tram trampoline within five days, then, uh, buy, or then seller will pay buyer $100. Can't do that. Can't do that. That's a legal right and remedy. All you can say is seller is to remove it. If the seller doesn't remove it, then the buyer sues them and lets the judge make that decision. Period. So it is imperative that licensees understand that they cannot put legal rights and remedies. They cannot go in and fill in stuff willy nilly. This is the part, this this slide right here is the second largest part that lawsuits occur because of the fact is they don't fill them out. I tell my agents 90% of the time, this is what needs to be in there. You want to know what needs to go in here if you work for me? 90% of the time? In A. In A. In A. Very rarely should anything be put in there. Very rarely. You cannot end up in that situation, go in and just fill out stuff. Okay? If you want to put something in here, you should have your broker review it or your team lead or whoever needs to review this. Okay? The next one, talking about default. Okay, this is where a client fails to do their duty. This is where these paragraphs and the contracts tend only to be looked at when it falls apart. Only when it falls apart. Can't tell you how many times in this particular situation. Let me see if I can't pull it up right here real quick for y'all. See here. One of those areas that's always kind of left out. People don't, they just kind of just go on through. Here we go. Right here. Paragraph 15. This part right here. Okay. Right here. If the buyer fails to comply with this contract, buyer will be in default and seller may, here's the biggest thing, you notice they have choices. They may enforce what's called specific performance, seek such other relief as may be prohibited by law or provided by law or both 
or terminate the contract and receive the earnest money as liquidated damages, thereby releasing both parties from this contract. So if in a situation, if the buyer fails to fulfill their duty, and this means you as an agent fail to do your job because your buyer should never be dealing with this part. Your buyer nor seller should ever be looking at this part, period. But in this situation, if the buyer is in default, the seller can enforce your client to still purchase the house. Right here, specific performance. Say for example, that you ended up, you're not watching your damn lines of your contract. Most real estate agents, they go, receive the contract, give to everybody, and what do you think they end up doing? Chunk it into zip forms, or chunk it into their deal, and they don't even look at it. I got, I got to go over here and worry about inspections. They don't even put those deadlines in their zip forms. Don't even do it. Well, what they ended up doing was they failed to full, uh, fully review the contract about the lending part, the deadlines on lending. Guess what? They miss lending, and their client ends up getting declined the loan. Because they got the time alone, they can't purchase the house. Guess what happens? Buyer's in big default. Buyer can't get the loan. Buyer goes over, can't get the loan, they default, seller goes and sues, wants the buyer to purchase the house. Buyer goes over and says, well, Mr. Grossman, my agent, he didn't fulfill his job and stay on top of the deadlines. He, would, he wasn't paying attention. The judge says, well, buyer, Mr. Eugene, it's not our problem that Mr. Grossman didn't do his job. You have to buy the house. You can't buy the house. You can't afford it. So what do you do, Mr. Eugene? You come after who? Mr. Grossman and the broker. And you're going to tell Mr. Grossman and the broker Give me the money to buy my house. Now, Mr. Grossman goes over. He's a new agent. He ain't got no money. Good luck getting anything out of him. So who are they going to come after? Broker. Coming after the broker. And if the broker ends up, they're going to come back and say the broker should have ended up, did what? Been a better supervisor. So the broker goes over and now has to pay damages. And some brokers, if they're a small brokerage, that's it. Oh, that'll put them bankrupt. If they're big brokerage, okay, they'll pay. But what happens is, if I have to pay, do you think I, as a broker, am just going to be like, oh, okay, well, I have to pay. So I uh, keep on practicing, Stephen. No, what's going to happen? I'm going to end up not just terminating, I'm going to report him to Trek, and I'm going to have his license taken and probably even look if I can find criminal charges. So in that situation is, you have to understand that you, as an agent, it's not something to play around with. This isn't a field that you can just willy-nilly come in here and just do it part-time. It's not like that. It's a full-time job, full-time stuff. If you can keep a calendar, you can stay on top of your deadlines, and you know your stuff, you'll be successful in this field. But the reason I emphasize this part right here, this provision, because if your buyer fails to fulfill their job, your buyer can still be required to purchase the property even if you ended up fail to fulfill your job. It is imperative, guys and gals, that you stay on top of your stuff. I can tell you, one of the biggest complaints about real estate agents about their brokers is that their brokers drive them crazy or their office administrators drive them crazy over getting 
their contracts and deadlines submitted. Biggest complaints. Because of the fact is, they just want to willy-nilly go down, file some paperwork, throw it on the, on the administrator's desk or email it to them, and then end up, be done with it. They just want to be done with it. But the thing that I want you to understand here in this situation is that there is a reason you do this. There's a reason. You may not see it. You may not understand it. But there's a reason. Okay? Again, if we continue reading, if the seller fails to comply with this contract, the seller will be in default, and the buyer may enforce specific performance, seek such other relief as may be provided by law, or both, and terminate the contract and receive earnest money, thereby releasing both parties from this contract. It goes both ways. The reason that it's such a bigger thing is both of them can be a big deal, but why I emphasize and harp on buyer's agent and not seller's agent, because here's the thing. A seller, yeah, they may end up purchasing a house and they may end up go through and, you know, okay, something falls through, the house ends up, they bought a house, they can't get their sold, now they're kind of in a catch-22, they have to put the property back on, but they still have the property to end up to sell. So the damages, while they may still be $10,000, maybe 20, is not gonna be as substantial as if Mr. Grossman was representing somebody and they were buying a $500,000 house. Because that client, things fall through. Mr. Grossman, you got 500 G's just to write a check on? No. So in that situation, you have to be very careful. You have to be alert in these situations. Okay? So I tell people, this is not something, this is not a career that you get to just basically willy-nilly do what you want to do. It's not like that. This is something that you have to take seriously. Okay? Extremely seriously. Now, as you can see, these paragraphs in the contracts tend only to be looked at when the transaction falls through. They make sure parties to the transaction read and understand what this paragraph means. I cannot emphasize it. There is one firm in town, I love what they do. They have their clients, uh, not sign, but initial next to that. They have their clients initial next to it. I don't do that, I send an email. I like to send an email and I like my clients to respond that they received it. It's better that way, okay? Versus initialing, they can say, oh, I did that by accident. If I emailed it to them and they said received, they read down to the very bottom of my email and they understood, okay? But it is important that your clients know that if they fail to do their duty, they can't come back and say, well, Mr. Grossman never told me that. The term you're going to learn in this program, and many of you probably know it already, you work a job, what's it called? Anybody know Miss Linda in here? It starts with the three little letters. You remember it, Miss Linda? C, say it. C, Y, A. What was that, Ms. Linda? Cover your ass. That's right, cover your ass. Excuse the language, but it's the truth. You need to know CYA. 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 I said that three times so it would stick. The key thing here is this. You don't you want to try to think of every single way that your client can say something. Something goes wrong, what are they going to say? Oh, it was my, my mistake. I, I take full ownership. Is that how clients do? No. no. Is that how customers do? No. 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 They're going to come back and they're going to say, well, Garrett never told me that. 
Or Keith, he never stated that. Keith said this. The best thing you end up doing and the best defense is you get it in writing. But I'm going to tell you, it needs to be in an email if you're going to use electronic, not so much text messages. Because the problem with text messages is there's so many programs out there where you can delete and edit and modify and all this. It needs to be in an email. And most likely in a certified email. Okay? Extremely, extremely important that it needs to be done like that. Now the next one, the most important one in this situation is that we want to make certain that as we're doing this, there needs to be signatures and effective dates. Miss Linda's probably already back there right off the bat, knows exactly where to go. Miss Linda, why did you kind of roll your eyes when I said effective dates? What's the problem with the effective dates, Miss Linda? Talk yes. a little loud so they can hear. Because that's the executed date. I couldn't hear what you said. They probably couldn't hear you. That's the executed date. So what's that mean? What's so important about it? That's the deadline, basically, you could say. Is that where all the numbers in the contracts are run off of? Yeah. yeah. See, what happens in this situation is everybody, of course, is going to sign the contract. They understand that. That's not rocket science. But the problem is, is the effective date. All the numbers in the contract, if that, if you don't have an, a, a, an executed date, you don't have an executed or an effective date, there's no dates to run off of in the contract. Mr. Grossman went down the other day, or yesterday, to receive a contract, and the seller, we're the buyer's agent, the seller's agent is supposed to fill it in, not even though it says right here, broker to fill in the effective date after last signature is provided. Okay. It truthfully is supposed to be the listing broker is supposed to fill in the, the execution date after everybody signed. But in real practice, unfortunately, what happens is the last person that signs or initials or whatever, that party fills it in. But Mr. Grossman went down to receive a contract and the seller's agent did not fill it in. And so he asked me in that situation, he said, well, what date do I put? And here's the rule for everybody. The rule is this, is it ends up, whatever date, the last thing happened on that contract, that's the date that goes in there, period. You hear me on that? The last time, it doesn't matter if it's signature, date, whatever, change amendment whatever the last day last thing that's happened that's the date that goes in what if you tell me well they initialed at 11 59 on 12 29 2020 11 29 2020 but that's last that was like like a minute ago doesn't matter but it was a minute ago it doesn't matter you're still in that time frame you're still in that time frame you still have to put the very last thing that occurred, that's it. It's done. It's fine. Okay. It is common for initial signatures, dates to be left off of a contract. Normally, it's not the contract. Normally, it's the addendas or the amendments. Can't tell you how many times it's been those two. It normally ends up it's the addendas or the amendments. Everybody gets the contract signed most of the time. It's the things that come after it. Or they won't even include the amendments. That's my favorite one. That goes back to this real quick. It goes back to this. There's a provision in the contract. What paragraph is it, Ms. Linda? I don't have it with me. Turn it this way. Yeah, put it that one. 22. 22. Paragraph 22. If you're looking at it, paragraph 22. My favorite part is this. People will X the box third party financing, but they won't even include the third party financing. And they don't have it checked X on the first page. Or it's not X on that paragraph three. Yeah. That's my favorite ones. Those are my favorite ones in those situations. 
they'll either not X them and include them, or they will X them but not include them. So my first, and we've had an issue with this before, and there was a case that actually went, actually with a lawsuit that occurred. What happened was a party went in and they did not check where Miss Linda was talking about. They did not check third party on paragraph three. They they um, yeah they didn't check it there and they didn't check it in paragraph twenty three. So they didn't check it in either spots. Twenty two. I'm sorry, paragraph twenty two. But they included the third party, and everybody signed it. And there was a lawsuit, and they said the the seller said the third party financing exclusions in there. Don't apply because it's not in the contract. Guess what the judge said? Seller, you're right. Just because it's included, if it's not X, it don't count. Period. It does not count. So therefore, the exclusion for you to back out of the contract is no longer valid. Therefore, you have to buy the house without a loan, and that's up to you. And it was because an agent was rushing through a contract and did not take their time. I cannot emphasize that enough, guys and gals. You've got to emphasize. You've got to take your time. You can't rush it. You cannot rush it. Okay? Under the e-signing UDTA, electronic signatures are as binding as if you wrote it out with your own hand. So parties must agree to electronic signatures when they're using an electronic consent form. Sending your form, this is another thing agents do horrible. They'll save one of these contracts that we showed you earlier <laughs> off the track. They don't have zip forms or any other DocuSign or, or dot loop or any of that. They don't have those things, okay? They're, they work for, especially this occurs a lot with small brokerages. They're small, maybe a one-man show, two-man show. But what happens is they'll just go on track, download them, put them into a PDF, type them in, and they send it to their client to just click, and it just a, a signature appears, which is not certified, just a signature appears, and they send it over. That does not count under the e-sign or the UETA. There has to be a consent to agree to electronically sign. There's a reason that we pay for subscriptions. Don't be cheap. If you're going to be cheap, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Make certain that you understand these, okay? Yes, Ms. Linda, can you talk loud, though? Also, I have seen in the past that when they, um, underneath the executed date, Sometimes the buyer's name or the seller's name is different from the from the top of page one. That name should match that. That is correct. And everybody's name that is on page one should be here as well. That's correct. That is exactly right. Whatever you put as the parties, when you go back here, right here, this first bullet, name of the parties. If you put Benjamin Charles Wright and Christina Wright. Then on that last page and everywhere else in the contract, it needs to say Benjamin Charles Wright, Christina Wright. You cannot change the names. It has to be the same all the way through. If you want to make your closing quicker, you want to include their full legal name, like we had, Benjamin Charles Wright. You want the full legal name because what happens when you get to closing, if it's not all the way correctly done, your clients get to go back and sign some other forms so that they can put that into the contract. It all needs to be the same, okay? Thank you for bringing that up, Ms. Linda. All right, so again, those are some of the things that you need to be aware of. Now, the addenda that are part of the contract needs to be identified in paragraph 22 of the TREC promulgated contract, uh, TREC promulgated contract. So again, like what we just talked about, if you're in a situation, and I will promise you, about 90% of the time, you're going to be adding an addendum. If you check anything in that box, you need to immediately go straight to the next one. Okay? Immediately. 
The key point here, and my most important point here, is this. Do not, do not do what most people do. They check the box. After they check the box, they fill out the paperwork, and they'll go in and fill out the form. But when he goes to send the forms off, guess what they do? They send the contract, and guess what? Only the contract. They forget the agendas. Okay? You have to make certain that the agendas are going to be included in the contract. If they're not included, does not count. Does not count. We just talked about that. You've got to make certain, guys and gals, no ifs, ands, buts about it. You've got to make certain that you include those in the contract. Yes, Ms. Linda? What if they may be make an error? Can they use whiteout? No. Whiteout is never acceptable. Ever. That's what they do, to fix it out. It's not if there needs to be, and this, I'm glad you brought that up. Very good questions. Okay. Say, for example, Ms. Linda, that you send to Mr. Keith a contract, okay? And you send it over to Mr. Keith. Mr. Keith represents you, Mr. Eugene, okay? And he, she sends over, you're selling your house for 200,000. We've got a list of four. Ms. Linda sends over a contract to Keith for $190,000, okay? You tell Mr. Keith, I'm not accepting it. I want $200,000. That's what I want. Mr. Keith calls back to Ms. Linda and says, Ms. Linda, he has said 200000 That's what he wants. He's not going any lower, Ms. Linda. Now, does Ms. Linda scrap the whole contract and retype 200000 and send it over to her, to Mr. Keith? No. Ms. Linda does not white out. She takes a line, marks through the 180. She writes 200 and she initials where she made the change. She then sends it to Keith and she tells Keith, I've made the change. Please have Mr. Eugene initial where I initialed and send it back. That is how you properly deal with any changes in a contract after it's been sent. I can tell you from experience that if you go through and you write a contract, okay, you go and write a contract and you end up, you don't fulfill or you, like I've seen this happen before. I've had it happen in many different ways. A contract goes, like I'll, I've done this before. I'll send a contract off, my initial one. Buyer goes over or the seller goes over, marks through it, sends it back. We go mark through it send it back, they go mark some more, send it back, and it goes back six, seven times, okay? So this paper has got scratches all over the place with signatures everywhere. And if you're OCD, what do you want to do, Stephanie, if you're OCD? You've got scratches all over the place. What do you want to do? I'll try to fix it. You want to fix it? You want to go back into the, into the zip forms and do what? Just type it all make it look pretty, right? I want to make it look pretty. Well, if you do that, everything that y'all have initially been doing, you basically threw it out the window and started all over from scratch. You cannot, you cannot end up redrafting it unless all parties are in agreement. If all parties say, let's just redo this whole thing and type it and send it over and everybody agrees to it, that's fine. But you do not just willy-nilly just because your OCD is like, oh, my God, what do I do? You don't do that. You let it stay unless somebody says differently. I've done that before. I'm that type of person. I like things to look nice. And I emailed an agent one time on a $1.5 million house. You should have seen the form. The form was so scratched up, it was horrible. I'm like, this is a $1.5 million house. This looks like, like somebody's kids drew all over the contract. So I wanted to go and make it look nice. So I contacted the other agent and I said, hey, do you mind if I go in and I do this and I, I change it? And the agent said, hell no. Don't you change that, you change it, you're, you, we back out of everything. 
So in that situation, you never leave, never willy-nilly go over there and just retype it to make it look pretty. You leave it alone. If both agents and parties agree, then that's fine. But you do not just take that on on your own. So if not, you go all the way with that. You will send it. I've sent, I have sent contracts all the way down to the to closing, the title, where they look like a two-year-old scribbled scratched all over it. Every page had scribbled scratch on it. We closed it. But you let it stay in that situation. Okay? You just let it stay. Now, common areas of concern. So, another area that we've harped on a lot, we've talked about, is basically real property versus personal. And the reason we bring this up is because it's very important. Like we talked earlier in this class, we said that one person's view of property may be real property, but to another person, guess what? It's personal. So what happens is it can either be personal or real estate, but you have to understand that there are often issues come up when the sellers assume that items are personal property and remove them from the property while the buyers assume that they're going to be part of it. The licensee should discuss these items that are known to cause problems, such as appliances, drapes, heirlooms, and other items that are going to be included. And you also want to include those items in your sales contract. I can tell a new agent miles away when I get a contract and the non, there's no non-realty items. I get a contract that does not have non-realty items and I'm like, I'm about to just own me an agent here. I'm going to destroy me an agent here in negotiations. You want to look like you don't know what you're doing? Send a contract with non-realty items. Don't send one. Just leave it blank. Don't even send it. You're going to tell the agent, the expert agent, they don't know what the heck they're doing. And nobody's reviewing their contracts. Okay? You want to make certain you include a non-realty items. Even if nothing is transferring, there's one thing that I always include. If you want to write this down, write it down. People will know it comes from me. Because I'm the only, only broker in town and only agent in town that does this. You fill out, say for example, on your non-realty items, you would say something like refrigerator, comma, stove, comma, microwave, comma, and any and all other personal property left on the property after closing and funding. Can you just say that at the very end? Any, any, any and all personal property at the time of closing and funding. And the reason I say that is because of this situation. Say it again, Miss Linda, and I'll tell you where it stopped at. No, go ahead. I got here. Okay. What happens is, is this, okay? Remember I told you earlier where a client goes to the property? They go, like we talked about this yesterday, they go to the property, they end up, after they go to the property, they end up, they do what? They end up, go to the property, they sign, everybody's done, the buyer goes there to get to see their property they just bought, and the seller is still in the property. Well, if that provision was in the contract that any and all personal property transfers to the buyer at closing and funding, what does that mean? That they just take what they, they have and go. The they own everything that the seller has in that property, and the police are to remove only the physical bodies of the seller not their stuff. They don't get to keep the seller? Nope, no. they don't get to keep the seller. You can't own a person. Because of the cause of his But you can own all their personal property. What if there's a renter in there? It doesn't matter. The renter does not count. Remember, if you signed a renter, they would, they would already be notified. Okay. 
We're talking about the self. So, so if Mr. Eugene, you went down there to sign and you got Miss Linda's money, okay, and you go back to your property and you're like, I got money and I ain't moving, and all your stuff is still in the property, and Miss Linda funds and everything. Miss Linda goes over there and all your stuff is still in that house. Miss Linda just has to pick up the phone. Hello, police. There is an intruder in my house. Can you please come and pick up this intruder and have them removed, please? Yep. The sheriff will come out. The sheriff will say, Mr. Eugene, okay. we need you to put your hands behind your back. You need to come with us, sir. And we're going to take you out of this house. And he's going to say, well, you ain't taking my property. Well, Mr. Eugene, put your hands behind your back. You need to get out of the house. And if it goes to court, now most likely the judge is not going to end up awarding everything to Miss Linda. But if it was to go there, we wanted to get technical. Miss Linda owns everything. It's her property. You signed the agreement. You didn't fulfill your duty. So in that situation there, it's a way for you to cover your client because what happens is, is if the seller won't move out, you come back out and you say, all right, Mr. Eugene, one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to leave and take your stuff or Miss Linda's just going to kick you out. She's going to keep all your stuff. You got two hours to get out of this house. Versus if you don't include that clause, there's not much Miss Linda can do, and she may be up a creek without a path because she can't be in there with Mr. Eugene's stuff. It's his stuff. So it's a way for you to end up, it's a tactic to protect your buyer. However, if you're a selling agent, you don't want that clause. If you're representing the seller, you don't want that clause in there because when you do it that way, guess what happens? Your seller now has an opportunity, they're not out in time, to lose everything. So, of course, an experienced agent is going to balk at that. A new agent, guess what they're going to do? They're going to sign it. And I would rather have a new agent sign it than an experienced agent because the fact is, it ends up, it puts you, most likely if it's a new agent, they don't know what they're doing, and there's a possibility the seller's going to stay. Well, if it is a experienced agent, they're going to be on top of their stuff, okay? But it's just insurance for your buyer, okay? Last slide. Can you believe it? Last slide over two weeks. We're on the last one, okay? The other area of concern is title questions. It's less of a contract mistake and more of a transaction issue. Okay, you're not going to really deal with it in contracts, but you're going to deal with it in the transaction. It's where the seller is generally required to give or to provide marketable title to the property. In some cases, the issues may arise that the seller didn't know about and might have nothing to do with the current seller. For example, the current seller may have not known that, for example, that when they purchased the property, from the previous owner that a mechanics lien was put against the property and they're going to sell the property and the mechanics lien was against the other owner. That could be an issue. It is a good idea to make parties aware that issues do come up during title searches that can affect the transaction. And I promise you, I promise you, it's going to happen. There is no ifs, ands, buts about it. There is nothing to that situation. It's going to happen. I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been in the industry. I've been in this industry over a decade. I know you can be the most, most knowledgeable, most on point, have every checklist that's out there. Something will happen. Mr. Grossman said it good yesterday. I said, Mr. Grossman, how's it feel got another contract under your belt? And his response was what, Mr. Grossman? What did you say? Uh, I don't feel like it's done until we signed and closed and funded. That's right. He doesn't feel like it's done until he signed, closed, and funded. 
Because that's the truth. It's the truth. You don't get happy just because you ended up, you got a contract. That's an experienced agent. A newbie agent, what do you think they would have done, Miss Linda? I got the contract. I got the contract, yay, I'm gonna go spend a ton of money because I'm getting a check. No, no. I don't get happy until, if there's a contingency, I don't get happy until that contingency is fulfilled. I don't get really happy until I get notice of what's called the clear to close. That's the only time. And that's a day or two before closing. I don't get happy in that situation sometimes. I get happy once I hear from the title company, your check's ready. That's when I get happy. I don't, I do not ever get happy about anything. Because in this industry, I can guarantee you, Mr. Stephan can tell you, Ms. Linda can tell you, most people can tell you in this industry, we do not get happy until everything has been done. I tell people this all the time. As long as people are involved, I don't get happy about nothing, <laughs> okay? Because somebody will screw it up. The more hands in the pot, the more issues there are gonna be, okay? So you've gotta make certain that you are aware of all of these different elements. You're aware of all these different items because it is a lot of stuff that you need to be aware of, period. Okay, so as you can tell, there is a lot of different areas of concern. Guys and gals, I can sit down here and I can tell you story after story after story after story, okay? I'll give you one, one last one here, and it's a good one, okay? It's a very good one. Client, or a, a agent of mine, he was selling a property. Property ends up, okay, property ends up, they get inspections done. They fulfill their inspections. So in that situation, they go through and they end up, they do their inspections, all right? And after they end up, they go and the inspect or the person ends up going over and they end up in this situation the person goes over and uh, the agent sends a, basically an amendment, okay? Sends an amendment back to my agent. So let me re-put this for a minute. We just had somebody walk in and I had to focus on something for a second. But what happened was this, my agent's listing, they're selling the property. Agent ended up, they're selling their property. They turn around. <laughs> They ended up, buyer comes in, buyer's agent said, we're going to do inspections. Inspections are done. Buyer's agent sends my agent an amendment for changes. And one of the things at the very top, very first line for the thing that they wanted the seller to fix or to repair was this. Remove lost nest and honey from garage. Lost honey. Hold on, hold on. Remove wasp, nest, and honey from garage. Mr. Garrett, got a question for you, sir. Yes, sir. Are you an educated young man? I like to think so. All right, and I'm gonna ask you a question. Do, do wasps make honey? No, sir. Are you sure? He went quiet on me on that one. Are you sure, Garrett? Uh, Say no, because you're right. Because the thing is, is we still to this day don't know what kind of wasp makes honey. Literally, we almost lost a sale, y'all, all of you. We almost lost a sale because the fact our client refused to remove the wasp's nest and honey. We were at closing and the buyer almost bagged out because the seller refused to remove the wasp nest and honey. No joke. 
Well, we don't know. We finally did close. With it still there. With it still there. <laughs> but the fact of the matter that I'm trying to tell you is how you put your words in your contract is extremely important. Okay? Because truthfully, we could have said that's impossible. And we've not broken any contracts because WAF don't make honey. So in that situation is, you've got to watch how you word things, and that's why in a situation, you've got to be careful when you're dealing with contracts. So what I always tell you, you want to make certain that you're on top of your words so that you don't look foolish, okay? Because it does not make you look good, okay? So... Again, like I said, that's a lot of areas. Again, I could sit here. There are plenty of people that could sit here, and, and I've got plenty of my agents that tell me all the time, we need to write a book. And I really am honestly thinking about starting, not a book, but like a, a sharing place where we can all share our stories. But, uh, but yeah, there's plenty of uh, stories you will have as a real estate agent, I promise you. Uh, but these are some of those common areas of concerns, okay? All right, so give me just a minute here.